Well, let's get started. Um, so, safe. Thanks yeah. for doing this today. I appreciate it. Um, Thank you. So the number one uh, thing we wanted to talk about was uh, was the principles of Austrian economics. So I understand you just created, a, you finished a course for the Sailor Academy on uh, Austrian economics. So why don't you start by uh, telling me about Austrian economics? Why is All Austrian right. economics important? Why should anybody want to learn it? Well, the way that uh, I look at it is that this is essentially the uh, long tradition of learning economics that has existed in most of the world's civilizations up until the 20th century came about. And then fiat money upended the natural order of the world. And uh, we had to come up with a pretty absurd substitute uh, for it, which was the modern neoclassical sort of Keynesian economics that is dominant in universities today. So, uh, you know, obviously this is a bit of a controversial uh, opinion that is not going to be very popular among people in the mainstream. But then again, these are the same people who tell you that Bitcoin is a scam and uh, you should uh, put all of your money in uh, dollars and treasuries. So uh, basically, the difference between mainstream economics and Austrian economics is almost similar to the difference between astronomy and astrology. Uh, regardless of what you think of astronomy and astrology, the two topics are, um, for all practical intents and purposes, different uh, fields. Even though they nominally deal with the same um, uh, subject, which is the stars, or economics in the case of uh, economics, uh, they're still pretty much two different uh, fields and two different approaches to studying uh, these phenomena that are completely different in their methods and in their conclusions and in their implications. Um, I think the fundamental starting point of Austrian economics and uh, the, the building block on which everything, from which everything else follows, which makes it uh, extremely at odds with uh, most of mainstream economics, is that uh, in Austrian economics, we start with the idea that value is subjective. Value is a product of the human mind. We give things value, and that is different from uh, the other schools of thought which have different theories of value. Um, some uh, will tell you that value is a product of the labor that goes into things, and so economic value is, is uh, given by labor. Others will tell you that value is something that is objective, that can be measured, um, and uh, the price is the measure of the value. But in Austrian economics, you start with the idea that value is subjective. And um, that basically makes a lot of um, mainstream economic analysis incompatible with um, Austrian economics, basically. And um, in a sense, the starting um, the, the starting point for, of economic analysis in Austrian economics is human action. It's the idea that human beings are acting. So whereas other schools of economics will tell you that they're studying the economy as an abstract concept, as if it is you know, a, a thing that we can study, in Austrian economics, the focus is on humans, on how human beings act and uh, human action as the uh, central focus. So we begin by thinking of value as being something that is subjective. And uh, that's the topic of the first lecture in the course, what it means that value is subjective. And then uh, in the second lecture, lecture, I introduce the topic of human action, which is the title of uh, Mises', uh, Mises is probably most important book, um, arguably, which is human action. And in it, he explains economics as the study of how human beings act. So, so the unit of anal analysis in economics is human beings are acting. And so what it is that they do, how they, uh, why do they take the courses of action that they take, and what do they get out of it. And then when you think of it this way, when you start thinking of the decisions that people make um, and how humans act under the context of scarcity, that's really the key idea then you come up with some uh, very important conclusions about how economics and economies work. That's basically um, the, the, the starting building block of economics. So all of the analysis and all of the conclusions follow from analyzing human beings' decision-making under the context of scarcity and not analyzing economic aggregates and not analyzing numbers and not looking at causality and um, agency 
in metrics. And that's, I think, the uh, you, can, you can already see the difference with the mainstream treatments of economics there. Okay. So I guess a couple of questions popped to mind. One is, how old is Austrian economics? Like, how long is the, has the subject existed, you know, as a body of knowledge? Arguably, it's uh, 150 years now. Uh, you could you generally uh, hear Karl Menger is the father of the Austrian school, and he wrote a book called Principles of Economics in 1870 or 1871. I'm not sure. Um, so it's the, the school really came into prominence in the 19th century under the gold standard in Austria. Uh, at a time when uh, Vienna and Austria were uh, some of the uh, world's uh, most important centers of education and culture. And um, this was, um, it, it wasn't so uniquely Austrian at that time. It was very similar and embedded to the rest of the world's classical economic education tradition. It wasn't very different from economics in Germany and um, England and Sweden and uh, other European countries. But later on, uh, after World War I, the, uh, the, the educa Austrian economics uh, or economics education all over Europe and the world changed drastically. And it was really the Austrians who carried the old classical tradition into the 20th century and preserved it. And that's why it gets called Austrian economics, which is uh, useful as a name, but in my opinion, does, doesn't do it justice because it's really just economics. And I think um, in a world in which we get rid of fiat money, or um, at least, you know, in a world in which we return to a hard money, then uh, I think people will recognize this as just economics. Yeah, so um, I, when I, th I think about this, you know, at first economic value being subjective and then human action, it just makes me think Austrian economics is, is creating... Um, a nonlinear dynamic feedback model of behavior, like how, how will humans behave, you know, based upon their value judgments and you'll have, you'll have first order feedback loops and second order feedback loops and third order effects. So it's like it's a dynamic model of economics based upon human action and reaction. And that just makes me think it feels like capitalism or it feels it's somewhere between capitalism where you have competition and reaction and increasing difficulty, right? I do work, difficulty increases, the markets evolve. Or maybe it's um, another metaphor is Darwinian. It's like competition in nature, except there, you know, the value, the value function is energy, right? Food, and then you've got the, the instead of human action, natural action, how will, how will uh, ecosystems evolve, you know, as you create supply shocks, or you uh, you create a famine or a shortage, and you know, is that, yeah. Do you study those sort of dynamics in Austrian economics. Yeah, you know, I think um, one interesting story here is um, uh, the science of complexity is uh, one of the um, cutting edge fields, and you know, the Santa Fe, Santa Fe Institute does a lot of work on trying to understand and model complexity. And as this work became popular, one of the uh, one of the leaders in this is, is uh, a professor by the name of Brian Arthur. And in an interview, he said, uh, after we started popular, popularizing our work, I got a lot of people who wrote to me and say, you know, a lot of your complex modeling is arriving at results that uh, Mises and Hayek and the Austrians had arrived at many decades ago. And Arthur says, you know, when they told me that, I wasn't familiar with these uh, people, but I dug up their books and I read them and I realized that that's essentially correct. You're, you're absolutely correct in the fact that by thinking of uh, the analytical unit as the individual and thinking of the analysis of uh, and, and analyzing using this as the framework of how individuals act, you're able to see how complex systems function in a much better way than with the reductionism that tries to mathematically model these things without uh, reference to human agency and human action, where, you know, if you look at a lot of macroeconomic models, it's as if the economy is a chemical, uh, chemistry experiment in a lab where, you know, if you throw in this much QE, you're going to get that much unemployment and this much uh, inflation and uh, this is going to happen to the uh, trade deficit or whatever. But uh, that's, uh, you know, these models can come up with a lot of complexities 
that end up not translating well to the real world and don't help you understand much of the real world. But I think when you think of the world in the, from the perspective of Austrian economics, you're able to see these complex phenomena, even though you might not have the kind of um, mathematical precision with which mainstream economists pretend to have. You know, they don't really have it. They just pretend to have it with these models. Um, Austrian economics doesn't have that kind of pretentiousness of thinking that we can um, model things mathematically and predict them. And yet you're able to see complex phenomena and understand them in a much more uh, satisfactory way. And I think um, Austrian business cycle is an example. Capital is another example. The concept of capital is something that just doesn't feature in mainstream economics prominently at all. Whereas in Austrian economics, it's very central, central as a concept in economics. And it's, it's a central topic in my course, uh, unit number four on capital and technology. Um, so you're able to think of those things much better and understand them and understand their function and understand how they relate to your own life and your, how your own, uh, they relate to your own economic decisions when you study them through the lens of human action. You know, when I was at MIT, I um, I studied uh, system dynamics, and it was nonlinear uh, nonlinear computer simulations, and it was uh, it was a, a discipline developed by Jay Forrester. He had created um, early missile defense systems. He was an expert in cyber cybernetics and servo mechanisms, and what he did is create computer simulations that modeled human behavior with feedback loops, and uh, he's very famous for for um, uh, work on urban dynamics and, and world dynamics. And, and ultimately, what they were, they were doing is they were creating nonlinear models of human behavior. So, so all of the predictive models that worked were nonlinear, and they required uh, human action and reaction. And uh, all of the, all the macroeconomic models and all the conventional economic models were linear. So I, I noticed that all the econ economists, they didn't use nonlinear math. They used linear math all the time. And it, and it seems like nothing in the real world can be described with linear math. Like, uh, for example, you know, they, they would try to fix the traffic problem in a city in urban dynamics. And so if it takes an hour to commute, the linear thinking is I'll just double the number of lanes on the highway. And so they would double the number of lanes on the highway and the commute time goes from an hour to 20 minutes for about a year. And then it goes back to an hour again. And then they double the lanes again and the commute would go down there, go right back up again, because because the linear thinking is if I increase, increase the number of highways, I solve the problem. But the nonlinear thinking is if you increase the number of lanes on the highway and you cut the commute time in half, the human action is everybody moves out of the city to the suburb at, because they can get a bigger house. And everybody that, that uh, lived outside of town that couldn't get into town for a job, they all start commuting in to shop and the city gets bigger and the number of people get bigger and the number of cars on the road get bigger. But the commute time never changes because of human action. And you can describe that with a, a nonlinear model with feedback but linear models always fail. And so the conventional economic response is, is to throw money at the problem and not succeed. And what you have to do is think differently. You have to think, what, what is it that causes these people you know, to want to sit on a road in a car for an hour? And is that a bad thing? And if I want to remove the traffic on the road... The solution is not to build more roads. The, the solution might very well be to discourage people from wanting to go into the city or, or uh, change another dynamic. Like you want to stop development, you can't. You have to do it either by raising the, the cost and make the relative attractiveness change so that people actually change their action. Exactly. Uh, as opposed to invest in a linear thing which is throw money at the problem yeah and i guess you know the 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 human action conception would look at it from the perspective of how do we get people to change the way that they act and i think you know a good way to do it is um instead of making them pay in uh, money spent on traffic make them pay in cash and then the people who value it the most will be the ones who pay for it and then you can keep 
uh, raising the charge until uh, you get the uh, you know the, the you get the time that you want. That's a solution that focuses on human action. Whereas if you're just building more lanes, you're ignoring how people are going to react to this. Yeah. So um, so this course, how long does it take for me to get through the course, Saifedean? Um, 30 hours is the time that's listed on the website. But I mean, if you wanted to really get uh, lost in the readings, uh, you, the, the sky's the limit. There's an endless amount of readings that you could uh, keep doing on the topic. Uh, but uh, I think 30 hours should probably, I mean, 30 hours of video and lectures and uh, the seminars um, will give you a good idea. And then you should probably budget another 20 hours of readings if you wanted to really uh, get, the, get, get the material pretty well. For, for people that are listening, if you go to sailor.org, S-A-Y-L-O-R.org, you can and go to courses, you can find this course and you can find all the materials. Yeah, so it says 30 hours. Um, tell me about, uh, are there lectures or are there readings? What, what's the, what are the components of the course? So there's a, there are 10 uh, lectures, 10 units in the course. Each unit has a one hour lecture and approximately one hour lecture and an approximately one hour to one hour and a half uh, seminar slash discussion session. Um, I recorded this course live. I was doing this course on my website. So there were uh, students who were joining me for each lecture. So it is to an extent interactive. It's like you're sitting in on a class when you want, it's like you're watching the recording of a class because I was interacting with the students during these. Uh, there was more interaction in the seminars. So for each unit, there's a seminar and the lecture. So going through all of these will be about 30 hours or so. And it's, um, it's, um, it's, it's like an, a gentle introduction to the concepts of Austrian economics. Uh, there are a lot of readings that are described, but I'd like to think of this as like the uh, introduction to those readings. So you begin with, uh, I mean, part of the reason that I that motivated me to do this course, to build this course, was that if you wanted to learn Austrian economics, you generally had to do it from, by reading the books of uh, people like Mari Rothbard and uh, Ludwig von Mises, who, yes, it's, it's not very easy for most people to um enjoy them although you know i i'm one of the nerds who does but it can be a little bit dry and you know uh, mises in particular and hayek you know they wrote in english but they thought in german so for english speakers it can take a little bit of getting used to uh to to read essentially german speakers writing in english but uh, and they were pretty wordy and i think the uh, perhaps the main drawback is that at their time they were complete outcasts and so in order to try and establish relevance for their writing they had to spend a lot of time dealing with mainstream ideas and so a lot of their writing is you know you're reading a book you're trying to learn about uh, capital or prices or something like that and it's just page after page of uh, Mises or Rothbard very meticulously uh, going through some um, socialist economists arguments and uh, uh, refuting them one by one and you know m most of these people are, are forgotten today so the Austrians survive because their work remains relevant but most of these other economists are forgotten and nobody reads their work so there's not much uh, entertainment or education value in reading the refutations of uh, very bad old ideas uh, so I try to skip over all of that and present the main concepts in uh, in videos and brief notes and then based on this, of course, I've built, uh, I've been writing my textbook, Principles of Economics, which I'm uh, publishing at the beginning of next year. It's, uh, it's uh, more than, it's about 70% done now. So based on this course, I've kind of uh, used it as the foundation to make a new textbook in Austrian economics, Principles of Economics. Okay. So um, I think I just added somebody from Sailor Academy. Who's on the line now? Okay, Jeff, welcome. So we have Jeff Davidson. Jeff's the director of the Sailor Academy. Okay, Jeff, hold a second. We've got some questions for you when I, when I get done growling, Saifedean. Hey, Saifedean, <laughs> I'm, I'm on Unit 7, Prices and Market Order, mm -hmm. on the website. So I see the market system lecture. I'm excited about that, and I drilled into it, and and it looks like it's a it's a one hour lecture. Is this posted on YouTube? And we just uh, 
we plugged it in. How did we host this lecture? Uh, no, it wasn't on YouTube. It was on my uh, on my own uh, website where uh, this was uh, being taught. But now it's offered on your website. It's been uploaded to sailor.org. So it's, it's a lecture for an hour, and you've got the outline of it. And then I see 7.2 is a discussion, and that's, a, that's another video. So tell me about the market system discussion. Yeah, so um, the way that this course begins is, first of all, I describe the uh, main foundational concepts of what makes economics and uh, the main ideas in economics. So um, labor, property, capital, technology, trade, money, indirect exchange. I, I, I develop what these things are. And then when all of these things are uh, developed from units one to six, you know, I introduce those concepts and discuss what they mean in economic terms, in terms of human action. Then in uh, unit seven, I describe how essentially all of this comes together into the market order, which is an extended impersonal social system in which people don't have to know each other. Strangers deal with one another. Uh, based on uh, their own self-interest and their own economizing. And they realize, as all of us have, without an exception, anybody in the world today, except if you're a, an isolated hermit, hermit, everybody realizes that being part of the market economy is better for you. You know, um, if you try to live on your own, it's very difficult to build the things that you um, want. It's very, it, you're much better off specializing, accumulating capital in one job, trying to be as productive as possible in that one job, taking your uh, products from that job, selling it on the market, giving it to others and exchanging it for money and then using that money to buy the goods that you want. And that's really the, the, the concept of the market economy in, uh, in the Austrian idea. And of course, within the Austrian school, the key concept that, uh, you know, the glue that holds all of this together is economic calculation, which is the topic of chapter eight. And it's, it's discussed in seven and eight. And economic calculation refers to the idea that, uh, refers to the action that people will uh, carry out every time they make an economic decision. And in a market order, where a market order is different from primitive economies, is that you're carrying out your calculation denominated in a monetary medium that everybody else uses. So you make all of your calculations in a currency that everybody else is using, which allows for people to trade to a, with, with a very large extent of people. You know, you no longer need to know everybody is uh, uh, what they want and what they like. You, they tell you how much they want in terms of the money, and then you can make all of your calculations uh, to figure out how you can provide them with the money that they uh, are asking for. So I, I noticed the general format for each of these things is... You've got a lecture, and uh, then you've got a discussion, and then you've got a review. And you followed that for a lot of. Did you follow it for all the modules, or just I, I saw? Yeah, well, um, when I did it on my website, it was lecture and discussion. But then uh, when we were adapting the course for sailor.org, they asked for the uh, review part, so we added that. Students that were in the class that you were teaching it live, is that correct? Yes. Is, there, is it the same students for each discussion, for each module? Um, I mean, yeah, it was the same group of students that were attending every week. How many students were in the discussion group? Um, it was generally about 20 to 30 or 40 or something like that who would turn up every week. Did they all contribute or were some of them more contributing than others? No, there was a lot. Uh, there were some who were more contributing than others. There, Gigi, if anybody uh, knows him on Twitter... Uh, okay, is wrote, Gigi the star of the discussion group? Pretty much, yeah. It's, uh, you, you'll tell from his uh, German accent uh, that there's a lot of Gigi in the course. So you're saying that if I, if I listen to all these discussions, I might be able to guess who Gigi is? <laughs> I think so, yeah. Well, I mean, he's spoken on podcasts. He has a pretty distinctive uh, German uh, accent. Okay, now I'm excited. This is interesting. <laughs> <laughs> so... So I, you know, so I, I get the lecture. That's all you. And the discussion is, is the student. So I get to be a fly on the wall. I think that's kind of cool. And then the, the market system review, maybe this is a sailor Academy idea. It looks like a cheat sheet. Okay. Safety. Did you know that in a barter economy with 10 goods, you would require 45 different prices 
But in a money economy with 10 goods, you only need nine prices. I think I do know about that, yeah, because I wrote it. <laughs> Save so your uh, your microphone's off. Oh, yeah. Oh, sorry. I was saying, yeah, I do know about that because I wrote it. <laughs> I, I love it. Okay, so we could ask the audience that a barter economy of a million goods that requires 500 billion different prices, how many prices do you need for a million goods in a money economy? This is great. 999,999. So, so this is just a cheat sheet at the end, right? So if I, uh, if I skipped the lecture and I read the <laughs> review, is it just as good or I should probably listen to the lecture too? I mean, uh, I, I think you should listen to the lecture, but you know, obviously I have, uh, <laughs> I made the lecture, so I'm biased here, but I, I've had plenty of satisfied customers, you know, um, instead of listening to uh, a podcast, you could uh, put this on 2x and listen to it. And I think you'll, uh, you'll come out with a with, with an interesting way of looking at the world. And I think it's quite uh, useful. So say, Fadeen, I just got to the most interesting section, unit nine, mm -hmm. violent intervention. Yeah. Uh, so tell me about violent intervention in Austrian economics. <laughs> this got my attention. Yeah, so a lot of people will say that, uh, you know, Austrian economics and all of these free market ideas are nice and dandy within the context of a market. But in order to have a market, you need to have a monopoly on violence. You need to have a state. You need to have um, uh, a system of uh, where, you know, you have the monopoly on violence that is where you have legitimate use of violence only allowed for one party in society. And this is where, you know, um, for many people, this is where economics stops being useful because that's politics and uh, that's not about uh, economics. But I think uh, this is a pretty um, myopic look at economics. And if you, if you, look, at, uh, uh, if you look at the work of uh, economists, Austrian economists like uh, Rothbard and Hans-Hermann Hoppe, they discussed the economics of uh, violence and defense and all of these issues quite extensively and quite intensively and intelligently, if I may say. And um, it's no different from any other kind of economic analysis. Ultimately, what we're talking about here is an economic good, which is peace and um, uh, you know, security. And that's an economic good. And if you analyze it as an economic good, like any other economic good, Everything that you, uh, you know, you, you can come up with a pretty good understanding of how security actually works. So um, if you have a free, if, if you have the idea prevalent in a society that one party is able to legitimately impose violence on others, um, then you're flying in the face of uh, what makes a peaceful society possible. Uh, which is that nobody gets to u initiate violence against anybody else. People can use violence in self-defense, but uh, in the initiation of violence is a problem. So uh, it's much better. Effectively, the anarchist idea is that if everybody uh, thinks, if everybody uh, believes that the initiation of violence is legitimate, then you're going to end up with a lot of violence being initiated because violence is profitable. Violence is just another way of getting stuff. So one way of getting stuff is you work and you give people something that they want and then they're very happy with you because you gave them what they want what they want, and they give you money in return. So that's uh, cooperation. And then there's coercion, which is you put a gun to their head and you tell them, give me what you want or you die and then they give you what you want. So it's, uh, the, the, I mean, the economics of this are um, no different from any other good. If you're able to, provide people with a good peacefully, uh, you're, if you're able to provide people with a good that they choose um, with, you know, out of their own consent, then you're going to have a thriving market that provides that good very well to the, produ to the consumers. And it's constantly competitive and the better people are providing it at the lowest price are able to do it and provide it. And so if you look at it uh, from that respect, it makes sense why the more that governments uh, interfere in the security market, the more we end up with um, violence. Um, on, the, on the other hand, you look around today, in fact, there are more private security guards in the world than there are police. 
it's already the case today. So all over the world, there are more private security guards than there are police. And if you think about it, you know, anybody you know who's got uh, serious uh, wealth to protect is relying on private security. Uh, there are highly specialized private security teams that are out there providing security for all kinds of things. So we already have a market in security and the majority of security is being provided for by the market. And in fact, um, you know, the what might sound a little bit too cynical, but if you have a monopoly on violence, it's highly unlikely that you're going to use that monopoly to the good of the people who don't have a choice in your monopoly. You're far more likely to use it for your own good. In the same way that you know, if you had a monopoly on um, potatoes in a specific country, you're not going to strive to give the consumers the best potatoes at the best price. You're going to get a lot very rich from it. So all kinds of monopolies end up working in that way. And I think uh, the monopoly of uh, security and defense is no different. So I look at unit 10 as economic progress. Uh, would it be a stretch to assume that the Austrian school believes that you know you get more economic process in a, in a peaceful, cooperative, competitive marketplace? Yeah, exactly. Um, I mean, ultimately, what uh, what 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 we do through the through the course is um, we describe all of the ways in which human beings can cooperate peacefully in which they can economize uh, without aggressing on one another so you can work and you invest and uh, you develop new technologies and you trade and you use money and you trade within a market system and uh, you apply entrepreneurship and all of these things lead to a proliferation in uh, production and increase in productivity and improvement in uh, material living standards as long as they're being done peacefully. And we know that that has to be the case because if people choose to take part in something, again, remember human action is the motivating assumption here. If somebody chooses to get out of their bed in the morning to take part in, uh, in, in some form of work or in order to trade, then they clearly see a benefit from it. They're clearly benefiting from it. Otherwise, they wouldn't get out of their bed. So everything that happens when people are being, um, w w everything that happens out of people's own free will, everything that happens out of their own uh, volition has to be uh, for their own good because they wouldn't have chosen it otherwise or you know, they're lear they're, they learn their lesson very quickly um, and, and change the way that they act. And then of course there's the other force which is um, what happens from violence, which is destruction, which is um, the threat of force the threat of the use of force, and that is likely to stall people's ability to economize and provide for themselves. And that's why, I mean, it's uh, it, it might seem, uh, uh, you know, within most mainstream economists, there's a focus on GDP, which uh, misses the point and tries to quantify the quantify something that is unquantifiable, which is human valuation. And as a result, it ends up being almost a little bit ridiculous because you can get GDP up uh, in any country by, uh, you know, uh, selling all of the uh, resources in the country or selling all of the uh, major capital that they have. In the same way that, you know, you, I can get my income up if I sell everything I own. Uh, I'd have a, a high income this month, but that's not very good because then next month I'm homeless and I don't have a car and I don't have a computer and it's going to get in the way of my work and it's going to get in the way of my productivity. So um, focusing on the mathematics has given economics a bad name. Focusing on you know getting GDP number to go up is um, is rightly ridiculed by people. But I think the concept of economic progress, uh, as valued by people out of their own volition, out of their own free will, to partake in the activities that they choose, is enormously important. And it's enormously important in a way that I think most people don't appreciate today, because people think. Uh, I, I don't think people quite understand how much uh, peace and capital formation is needed in order to make our daily existence possible. You know, how many millions of people need to cooperate every morning in order for your cup of coffee to be there when you want to drink it. It's, uh, it, it requires a lot of um, capitalism and peace and cooperation. And uh, People like to say a lot of bad things about capitalism, but they still get all of their nice stuff from capitalism. And they 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 have no way of making those things without the cooperation of many many millions of people all over the world who uh, need to cooperate in order to make and produce these goods so um the scary thing is that as we drift away from 
free markets from people being able to take part in the trade that they want as we have a world in which we have more taxes more central planning um, that foundation of society begins to crumble and you see it happen in societies where a hyperinflation takes place you know that's kind of the final stage of uh, when, when the foundations collapse is when the money falls apart and then you no longer have a market economy and you've returned to essentially a primitive society yeah, so Austrian economics is <clears throat> is the study of peaceful cooperation more so, and conventional economics is is more about centrally planned coercion. Is that how you would think of it? Absolutely, and a lot of Keynesian economics uh, came along during the World War, and it was um, it it has a lot of uh, central planning uh, undertones to it. It looks at human society like a general would look at soldiers. You know, there are people who are meant to follow orders in order to achieve your own goals. Um, and uh, you could even say like a farmer looks at their cattle. You know, we have this many cows, we have to feed them this much and then how much milk we can get out of them and how much meat and hides and so on. Um, there's, you know, in, in the mainstream economics, there's this focus on how do we get tax revenue up and how does the government manage the economy well. Whereas from Austrian economics, you know, these are questions that are answered both with one answer, which is zero, that, you know, there shouldn't be um, intervention by the government in uh, society. And people are able to, in, in the market economy, because people can make their own decisions. You know, people want to buy something, they can buy it. If they don't want to buy it, they don't. So how, uh, what are the prerequisites to take the course, say, for the, so like, um, what, what basically, kind of background do I need to get value from this if I'm going to go through the 30 hours? Um, in my mind, uh, uh, reading comprehension, the ability to read the long sentences and uh, sit through... Uh, the college the, freshman the level? Yeah, I think it's I think it's 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 definitely uh, easy enough for a college freshman, but I think also um, it'll be useful for somebody who's got higher degrees as well. Okay, is there a test? There is a test at the end. Yes. Oh, is this one test? There's one final examination. Yep. Is it hard? Can I pass it? Is it easy? How <laughs> how hard is it? You know, I'm not sure. It's really hard for me to be able to tell because. Um, it, it, it's not easy. Testing is the most tricky part of education. Actually, you know, when I did the course on my website, I didn't have a test. And I just told people, you know, I'm uh, going to be teaching stuff. I'm not going to be offering tests and I'm not going to be offering degrees. If you think you want to take a test, just go read more Mises. Spend all that time reading more Mises until you think you would pass a test. And uh, I'm, I'm just not very good at testing. And I don't think it's, uh, it's something that is very easy to do. Uh, but uh, for sailor.org, we did it, that we had to do that for the course. So I guess the next question is, who should take this course? Um, I'm talking it, big, like there's 8 billion people on the planet, so reduce it for me. Tell me who should take this course and who doesn't need this course. I think people who don't need this course are people who don't expect to be making decisions in their life and people who don't care about their future and people who don't want to uh, conduct any economic activities. So that pretty much leaves 8 billion people that I think. Uh, uh, you think any, any is, business person or any any wage earner? Yeah, I think, I, I think it's useful for everybody because to be honest, a lot of these concepts, they're very important and foundational in how we think about the world and how we think about economic activity. But very few people spend time to actually think about, you know, what do we actually mean by capitalism? What is capital? What is a market economy? There are a lot of pop definitions and a lot of, um, I would say, wrong definitions that you get from taking a, an economics course in university. But this is pretty different and it's uh, very useful because you will uh, understand them from the context of uh, human action. So you'll see how they're relevant for your life. You'll understand what is the distinction between capital goods and consumer goods, and it'll help you think about goods. And you'll think about time preference as well, which I think is uh, very important for everybody to learn about. So safe. let's assume that, uh, that we agree it's a good course, and I have children. When should <laughs> I put my children through this course? What age? Well, um, my five-year-old already knows about time preference. And uh, basically, every time I uh, want to 
tell her to not do something. I just tell her it's high time preference and she immediately realizes, oh no, we can't be high time preference. So it's never too early to <laughs> get them on the bandwagon. But realistically, I'm guessing 15 is probably... Uh, an, uh, could, you, could you take this in high school? Yeah, I think so. Should we teach this in high schools? I definitely will be teaching it to my kids um, by high school age for sure. I think it's. Uh, I think these things are extremely important. Like when I learned about time preference, it really changed my life. Once I understood that everything I'm doing in life is a trade-off between my present and the future, and once you um, are hit with the realization that everything you're going through today is essentially the consequence of the high time preference decisions that you took in the past or the low time preference decisions that you took in the past. It really changes the way you act. Like you yeah, can't you're just... trading with your future self. Yes. And that's just a very powerful mental framework to use. Once you start thinking about it, I think, and I've seen it uh, happen to me and to many other people, like your life becomes about you. You know, you realize that the vast majority of your interactions are with your future self. And if you get that in order, then you don't have to worry about anybody else. And if you don't have that in order, then nothing that anybody else can do is really going to help you in the long run. So so um, what percentage uh, of universities? Well, first of all, I know this answer. How many high schools in the world have an Austrian economics course? Oh, uh, I don't know. Um, I don't know of any. I don't Zero point zero something. So, so this most. is a pretty revolutionary thing at the high school level, right? There's. I'm sure that I wasn't given any economics and certainly not Austrian economics in high school. What percentage of colleges offer Austrian economics? Less than 1% for sure. Okay, so what we have is less than 1% of, was well, 0% of high schools, 1% of colleges offer Austrian economics. So it's pretty revolutionary just to have the option today. <clears throat> And Absolutely, I, guess that I think gets so. Us to the question of digital education, right? Can you, can you yeah. talk about that for a second, right? Because we're doing this via digital education, which is going to change the cost, but also the availability of education. Safe, what is your opinion of digital education, and 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 why were you attracted to build this course and upload it? Well, I used to teach at a university up until a couple of years ago, and um, I decided to take time off from university after I wrote the Bitcoin Standard and I made a bit of a name and had an audience. I decided I was having much more of an impact interacting with uh, my readers on Twitter and influencing more people and being able to uh, educate many more people around the world than I was at a university because at a university, you're limited to um, you know three courses a semester, which is 100 students or 120 students at most. And then a lot of these people are just doing it because they want to graduate. A lot of them are doing it because their parents want them to go through college. Most of them aren't, well, maybe most is an exaggeration, but a lot of them aren't even interested and they're just uh, going through the motions. Whereas um, with uh, digital education, you can connect with people who are extremely interested. And that's extremely beneficial for a teacher because, uh, honestly, I learned by teaching. You know, the way that I was able to write um, the fiat standard, which is coming out in a couple of months in the Bitcoin standard, and principles of economics was that I taught these things as courses first. And uh, I, I, by teaching, I, I, it forces me to clarify my ideas and then the questions and the interaction with students is, um, you know, it, it really re makes you refine your ideas and then it allows you to um, lay them out in a way that it's clear. And I think that's, if you were to ask me about the secret behind the success of my writing, I would say that's it. You know, I, I teach the things before I uh, write them. So I enjoy doing that. And so I decided I'm going to take time out from university. I'm going to try and do this online. And it's, uh, you know, it allows me to get to a much larger number of people because obviously for all of the benefits of digitization and the, the, these ideas I had because, you know, I've been using the Internet, but it really uh, what crystallized and clarified these ideas for me. Uh, was reading your work on uh, the mobile wave and just thinking about how transformative this is and just how much it, uh, you know, thinking about the economics of how much money a student needs to spend in order to go to a physical university and how much time they need to do, spend on engaging in all of these um, tangential rituals that uh, are attached to education these days versus, you know, what the digital revolution, which allows us to get straight to the point. You know, if you're looking at, to learn economics, you could 
go through an enormous amount of uh, hassle to get to a university and take the courses and take all these other courses or you could just sign up to a course online and that that was the idea behind uh, education on my website safedean.com i started that uh, two years ago, roughly two and a half years ago, and it's gone really well. And I, uh, and, and also, uh, obviously, you know, your work on sailor.org is absolutely amazing. Um, it's taking this to the next level by, um, you know, producing these uh, courses for anybody all over the world to be able to take them. I'm wondering, you must have run the numbers. How much does it cost you to get a student, uh, to give a student a full education, uh, a full university level uh, degree uh, per student? How much does, does it cost on sailor.org? Uh, uh, at sailor.org? Yeah. Hey, Jeff, maybe that's a good question for you. How many students do we sign up every week at sailor.org? Well, what, what are our numbers right now? Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, we hear you fine. Yeah, so right now, every single week, just over 5,000. An interesting point about that is that in, in America, the average community college has about 4,400 students. So it's as if right now we're opening a free cyber college every week and putting 5,000 people every single week and they're not leaving right they're sticking around um so that's really exciting um and as michael likes to say once now that we've got the infrastructure up you know the cost of adding another student is is you know ne near zero right uh, now that everything's up um and running and so it, it's it's a it's a you know we can really we can scale as much as the world wants <laughs> it's a, i mean it's effectively free safety like, yeah, I, I think there's, I mean, there's, there's a couple of powerful ideas, right? The most powerful ideas of the 21st century are the digital transformation, digital transformation of music, digital transformation of books, digital transformation of maps, digital transformation of education. And the way I look at it, and it's digital transformation of property, right? That's what Bitcoin is. I look at it and I say, you know, it cost me. You know, I, I pretty much spent all of the money my family had accumulated in 250 years since they hit the shore of America. I spent it all in the first three weeks at MIT. <laughs> like, <laughs> like the three weeks of MIT depleted the capital of the Sailor fa family from 1736 onward. And, uh, and I'm sitting in this lecture hall at MIT watching a professor, Walter Lewin, talk about physics with 500 other people all that you know some of them went to private school and had a, a bit better education than me and i'm at the end in the back row squinting trying to follow the thing and uh and you know you do the calculation and you think you know i'm, I'm paying like 300 dollars an hour to sit in a room with 497 other people 100 feet from a guy screeching chalk on a blackboard and uh, and so when I left, you know, I, I thought, well, that was that's a quarter million dollar education for me at the time. And the U.S. Air Force paid for it. And uh, and and so I'm grateful to the U.S. Air Force. The government paid for it. I was I was subsidized by the government. And uh, how many other people could afford to get a quarter million dollar education or scholarship from the U.S. government? I mean, and I only got the undergraduate degree. And if I, you know, if you wanted the PhD, you're looking at a million dollars by the time you're done getting through everything. So you do the calculation and you think, well, it cost a million dollars from, as another half a million or a million dollars to go K through 12, right? So, but let's just say it's a million dollars to get to PhD. Well, what if you want to do a billion of them? You know, and you realize there's only 10 million people with a PhD in the world. And so how do you get to the point where you've got a billion people with a PhD? And the answer is that a million dollars a crack, you can't afford to do it. So the answer to your question is how much does it cost us? It costs us like the cost of the electricity. Sustainable electricity, I will add to the people listening. Good, <laughs> sustainable, clean electricity, whatever that might be. Um, and uh, so the digital transformation is the simple idea. What if we just took the lecture, uploaded it, took the book, turned it into a digital book? We bought up, you know, digital textbook rights. We published them. We find professors like you and, and we pay them to create a course and then we get the open source rights. 
we publish it. And I got to say, it kind of made the reason I did it is it kind of made me angry that my family would be impoverished for me to go to school for three weeks. You know, like, it just kind of makes you angry, especially when you study Isaac Newton and you realize that Isaac Newton published Principia Mathematica back in whatever, 1776 or something. And he, he basically open sourced all of the mathematics that you would need to get a Ph.D. in math. And so why is it that a university and some author is taxing you to study mathematics 200 years or 250 years after Isaac Newton pretty much put it all in the public domain? It just doesn't seem fair. It doesn't seem right. So the joke, of course, is on Sailor Academy, when I went back to the physics course, we have the same Walter Lewin lectures and the same, the same uh, lecture hall that I went to at MIT and whereas I was spending infinite amounts of money to sit in that lecture hall, you can now watch the lectures for free at your own pace, at your own speed. And they're, and they're actually better. You learn better. So my, my enthusiasm for digital education is why can't we give people a million dollars of education for about, I guess, the rental cost of an iPad or the rental, a used computer? If you amortize the computer over five years and bought one for 500 bucks, then maybe a hundred dollars a year for whatever that is, I ought to be able to reduce it from a million dollars to less than a thousand dollars. So that would be a factor of a factor of a thousand. Yeah. Factor of a thousand decrease. And, and the goal is not just to make it a thousand times cheaper, right? The real goal if you want to cure cancer or or you want to create space travel or if you want to if you want to solve problems of world hunger you're not going to do it with an undergraduate education or a high school education you need a phd or a master's degree you need to get to the point where you are theoretically capable of making a seminal contribution to the body of knowledge of the human race and so that means you need to get like graduate level in some area, whatever it might be. And we can't, we can't afford to do it now. Like I guess 90, 95% of people can't afford to get the degree that they want. And the society can only afford to create one to 5% as many degrees or, uh, and degree is like an old 20th century concept, which is like one to 5% as many educated individuals as it needs. So we've got a problem of, of quantity as well as cost. And if you, if you have linear thinking, the linear thinking is let's just, let's just give everybody a million dollars to get free education using bricks and mortar, right? That linear thinking bankrupts the entire country. The nonlinear thinking is why don't we just dematerialize all the lectures and upload them and make them available for free and do a thousand times as much educating for a thousand times less money and let it spread to everybody on earth. That That's why I'm enthusiastic about this thing. Yeah, me too. That's why I'm delighted to be joining you on this. I think the, the, people just underestimate the potential for it. I think universities have so much waste because ultimately uh, th th they've been separated from market discipline, which is something that I get to in the next course, which is coming to sailor.org um, in, in a couple of months, which is Economics uh, 2, Principles of Economics 2, the, the course that follows this one. Um, and I also get into it in my next book, The Fiat Standard. In, in, um, you know, when, you, when you have money essentially provided by government, which is the case in education, it distorts people's ability to think about opportunity cost. And that's why education can just become so expensive because you've got government subsidizing the credit and government subsidizing the university's research. So there's an enormous amount of money there and not a lot of incentive to be uh, economical about it. I remember a few years ago, I used to always say, you know, where's the uh, Steve Jobs of education? Why aren't universities coming up with something um, innovative, groundbreaking, coming, uh, really improving the university experience massively. And at that time, I hadn't heard about Sailor.org, but now I know that uh, the, the Steve Jobs of education is Michael Sailor. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. Probably Khan Academy is like the big winner there. Hey, Can Jeff? I jump in for a second? 
Yeah, Jeff, yes. how many students do we have total so far on Sailor Academy? What's our number? So we are fast. We, we're, the other day when I looked, it was 977,000. So if we keep our current, I assume we'll get a little bump today. <laughs> Uh, but uh, we're, when we do should, we hit a million? I want to have a million. It, it's going to be right around. It's going to be right around Labor Day. Wow! At latest, maybe sooner, but at latest. So, so Jeff, what are your thoughts on this? Tell us about you know what you think about digital education and and the future. Yeah, a couple things. Um, one, I've been I've been here ten years now working for you, Michael. So thank you for that. Uh, so I've seen I've seen a lot in the ten years when I first got to Sailor Academy. I was a business undergrad and I have a law degree from the traditional system. And I got on and I looked at the business courses first because I knew that. And, I, and I, I remember saying out loud in the office, like, wait a minute, why isn't this worth college credit? <laughs> uh, and everyone's like, yeah, we, yeah, we think they're pretty good. And, I, you know, we, we hire professors from around the world like Safe and Ian and, and Michael with the great support bringing experts like Safe and others uh, to the site. And so we have professors from – you know, Harvard and community colleges and everywhere in between coming together, curating resources, creating resources. Um, and so over the 10 years, you see now the gradual and now accelerating acceptance of online education. And now I think what universities are starting to catch on to, but some are going to miss it, is now the the speed at which um, non-traditional credentials, um, certificates from places like us and others are going to impact. We have people in Rwanda getting jobs with Sailor Academy certificates. Uh, that's really profound. Uh, what, we have people, what, what countries do we have students in? Tell me about our student enrollment. We, we, we have 230 plus. We Actually, I'm pretty sure we have a student in every country except the three the, the state government, uh, the United States will not let us reach but other than that i think pretty sure we cover everybody that's 200 so it's 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 a bigger number than the, it's because you got territories it's like 236 to two something how are we doing Way up africa? There. africa is huge uh india is huge africa in particular you have ghana and kenya nigeria is huge for south africa uh and and Almost every country there as well, but but Morocco, all, up and down the entire continent of Africa, a lot of Indonesia, Philippines <clears throat> now coming in. Uh, America. I, I got to break in right now, Jeff, and just tell one funny story, which is <clears throat> when you, you, some people get it, they think, oh, this is great. We can make education free for everybody on earth and help the world. And some people just are so, so stuck in their mindset. I remember talking to one group like of, of nursing, uh, nursing teachers. And we said, you know, we can make a nursing curriculum available online for free for all the nurses. And they said, so, you know, you're going to license nurses, uh, educate nurses in Virginia, right? So, yeah, we can make it free for every nurse in Virginia. And they're like, but you're not going to make this for West Virginia, are you? We don't want West Virginia, just Virginia. And I just kind of hit my head. I was like, are you really kidding me? Like, you have education. The traditional education establishment doesn't want you to carry your credentials across state lines, much less carry them to Ghana or Kenya. <laughs> and so the struggle really is is educating the world and certifying them and getting over some of the conventional accreditation uh, barriers that are holding us back. Yeah, speaking of bureaucrats holding us back, just real quick anecdote. Probably about five years ago maybe four to five, a DC bureaucrat came to our office and told, informed us that Sailor Academy was operating illegally because it was against the law in Washington, DC to give away education. <laughs> uh, and, and they didn't realize we had a couple of lawyers on staff and we quickly chased them away. Uh, but it was, you know, it was really kind of an uh, interesting, <laughs> shocking thing to hear. Right. Uh, against and, the law and, to give away stuff it, it, literally and, and uh you know and, and it was like wow uh so we we you know we they they went away but it was just kind of a weird week or so of interaction uh but uh, i want to go back to the course for a second yeah. say uh, you mentioned the exam uh i know we put you through the we we put you through a little bit of work uh, so we pr appreciate your patience on creating that exam tell us about the format are there case studies what tell us tell us about how that is going to set up so people get to it they know what to expect yeah there's uh, there are a bunch of uh, case studies where um, based on the topic of the of the lecture we'd um, we present a case study and then uh, ask questions about it in light of the lecture so 
it's 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 meant to be practical in a way that uh, can help you apply the concepts into real world problems, uh, which is kind of uh, the sticky point that many people get into, which is uh, how how does this translate to the real world? So. Um, I hope the exams will help answer this question because you'll see the ideas applied. Yeah, that's great. And one thing we do, one study tip besides the reviews that Michael and you were talking about earlier is when you look at the syllabus of the course, there are detailed learning outcomes at the course level and the unit level. <clears throat> and say, uh, as I understand it, it um, every question in the exam is tied back to one of those unit and course outcomes, right? Yeah, you guys are very thorough and meticulous about how you design your courses. Uh, it, it, it's uh, and it also really helped me clarify my ideas because I did them. Uh, I did the course, I taught it, but then having to structure it all in terms of the learning objectives and then to make questions about it um, was also helpful in uh, me structuring my ideas later on for the book which I'm uh, working on now. So, That's great. Uh, so we're Go getting ahead. close to the end. I guess quick final question. So Seyfedin, what comes next? Are you going to do another course, I think? or, or? Well, on sailor.org, yeah, I've got two coming up. Uh, there's the uh, follow-up to this course, Econom Principles of Economics 2, which uh, I'm going to start working on with Jeff and the team uh, soon. And then there's the third one, which was essentially the, uh, the, the prelude to the fiat standard. It's the material that was to later become the fiat standard. Uh, which is my book that's coming out in the next couple of months. Uh, that's also coming to sailor.org. Okay. Jeff, how many courses do we have on uh, on Sailor, the sailor.org website right now? It's about 100 and just right around 110. And, uh, you know, majority of those are full length semester college level courses where you cover. If you look at our World Regional Geography course as random as random choice, um, it's all the concepts you would encounter in a typical university. Um, and then we also have a bunch of short uh, professional development courses like the Bitcoin for Everybody course. Um, hey, Jeff, I wanna... so how many people have taken the Bitcoin for Everybody course? We're well over 10,000 now uh, in that course. And so that's really exciting. And for many, many countries as well. Uh, uh, and so, in fact, we have a student profile from a gentleman from Africa talking about how great he, and he's teaching it to others. Uh, and so that, you know, I want to quickly, I, I know there's a lot of Bitcoiners uh, listening to this. I want to thank that community for augmenting the tweets and, and getting the word out. And I see them tweeting about us to uh, people uh, all the time on Twitter. So really, we really appreciate that support. Um, uh, you know, we had, we have, we had, and what's cool is a lot of people coming for Bitcoin course, uh, are staying, uh, for computer science or, or whatever economics. And now we're bringing them in with this course with safe and, uh, and then teach them some other stuff as well. Um, so Jeff, it's very exciting. What, what are the, what are the most popular courses on the website? Yeah. So, um, our English is a second language courses that you might expect are really popular. We're starting to get, um, you know, people from many, many countries uh, taking those, but you know, computer science, all the different ones from, you know, Python to operating systems. Uh, we even have a software engineering course. In fact, we're putting out soon a, a, a pathway where you can take six courses that lead you down the path of, of a software development special certificate uh, called a Sailor, a Sailor Series uh, certificate. So, so um, I would have, I'm sorry to cut you off, but yeah. what's that? So if I were to summarize, everybody wants to learn English. English is important. Everybody wants to learn Bitcoin. Bitcoin is important. That's money. Now we're going to teach them the theory of economics from the Austrian point of view and uh, computer science. Why can't, why can't millions and millions of people learn computer science without paying for it if they have a computer? And we so, even have, real quick, we just add to that point, we're at the end, but we also have a complete foundational liberal arts education. I think that's really important to note as well. Critical thinking, philosophy, sociology, psychology, et cetera. All that is there as well, in addition to what you mentioned. Cool. So, Seyfedin, you have any final uh, words for the group or any final thoughts on the experience? What would you learn from it? What do you, what do you expect moving forward? Um, I'm going to say I, I love it and I wish you guys all the best. I'm excited to be a part of this. I think uh, it's something that I plan on doing a lot more of over time. Um, I, I enjoy teaching. It was uh, when I used to teach at university, it was something that I truly enjoyed. And um, it 
helps me work it helps me write so i'm looking forward to doing more of this on my website and making my website more of a uh, you know a bigger better uh, uh, learning platform and hopefully working with you guys on more and more courses jeff final words for the group uh, just thanks everybody for spreading the word and uh th again thank you both safe dean this has uh, really been great I think it's really helpful to people kind of get this different perspective. Um, and we're seeing how in the course, how, you know, it differs from mainstream economics. Well, also there's a lot of contributions that Austrian has made to mainstream as well. So those kinds of things are really great. And so just thank you both for hosting this. It's exciting. Well, I'll say I'm kind of excited to take the course. I want to watch Gigi and, and Seyfedean <laughs> joust back and forth in their, in their little recitations. I want to see what happens. <clears throat> Gigi's going to be immortalized as like the, you know, as as the uh, perennial student, right? <laughs> yeah, but, you know, he's becoming a master on his own uh, now. He, he's uh, he, he's uh, outgrown uh, being a student, I think. <laughs> I Yeah, I think so, too. I don't I, I don't know. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll see what happens. OK, so I, I want to thank everybody that uh, tuned in to this spaces. And uh, if you're interested in free education, check out sailor.org. If you're interested in Austrian economics, feel free to take the course and also share it with anybody and uh, let your local university or your local high school know they can embed it in the curriculum. This is all open, open source, you know, Creative Commons license. So you can steal it. Feel free. Go for it. <laughs>